Good morning, and uh, I too wish you a happy Mother's Day, and hope you have a wonderful celebration of that this Sunday. I was struck as Mark read the psalm, and the Lord is spoken of as the Lord of glory, and we find him in a very different condition in the text that we look at this morning. It's not a, an occasion of glory, just the opposite. Come to Gethsemane. We are in Mark chapter four, uh, rather 14, and looking verses at verses 32 through 42. They came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In the Kedron Valley, at the foot of the Mount of Olives, just below the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, is an ancient orchard. An old Puritan hymn gives the meaning of its name, Gethsemane the Olive Press. And why so named? Let angels guess. The guess is not hard for angels or men. The garden was so named because the place where olives were pressed for their oil is where the Savior's soul was so pressed he sweated blood. That's our subject, Christ's agony in Gethsemane. Bishop Ryle was right when he spoke of it as a deep and mysterious passage of Scripture containing things the wisest divines cannot fully explain. What we can know is that this is the place and the moment where Jesus decided finally and resolutely to go to the cross. It is the hinge on which human history turned, and it is deep and mysterious. His death was prophesied. He knew that well and announced it to his disciples numerous times. Only a few hours earlier, he had explained how the Passover was a prophecy of his death. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he told them. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. That was a word of encouragement to them. And yet as, he came, as it came time for him to go, he hesitated. He knew he was to die, but he also knew what that death meant. The suffering it involved. And as a man in his human heart and mind, the reality made him pause and seek certainty about going forward. And to do that, he entered the garden where he frequently went 
when he needed a place to be alone and pray, Gethsemane, the olive press. It was likely owned by one of his followers who gave the Lord open access to it. John says in his gospel that Jesus would often meet with his disciples there. So Judas knew about it. In fact, while this drama unfolded in the garden, Judas had tipped off the priests and was preparing to lead guards and soldiers there. Jesus knew that. He knew time was short. Mark says when he arrived at Gethsemane, he began to be very distressed and troubled. He told his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. Then he took three disciples into the garden with him, Peter, James, and John, and asked them to keep watch. He needed to be alone in prayer to know for certain the Father's will. He was in such anguish, he repeated to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. And we probably should take him literally. The weight of the moment was so great it almost killed him. It would only become more intense. It's in Luke's gospel we learn that he sweat great drops of blood. That's a very unusual thing, and it's not altogether clear medically how it could happen, but it shows just how intense, unusually intense things were. Evidently, the anguish caused the capillaries to dilate and burst, the blood then seeped through his pores and mingled with his sweat. The three disciples who were nearby were the ones who earlier had seen his transfiguration. So those who witnessed his ecstasy on the mountain now witnessed his agony in the garden. After speaking to the three, he went a little deeper into the garden and Mark says, he fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. The hour was not that distressing hour there in the garden, but the cross. He spoke frequently of his death in that way as his hour. We read that frequently in the Gospel of John. That's the meaning of the cup as well in verse 36 earlier in chapter 10, he spoke of his death as the cup that he would drink. And so now, as his hour was upon him, and he was about to drink the cup, he earnestly prayed that he might avoid that death. If it be possible, he prayed, remove this cup from me. He knew that all things are possible with his father. Maybe avoiding the cross was possible. It was possible for Abraham not to sacrifice Isaac. Maybe there was a, a ram in a thicket for him. If so, he prayed, remove it from me. He felt that desire urgently. In fact, the terror of his approaching death was so great that the author of Hebrews reveals something that's not found in the Gospels. He tells us that as he lay on the ground, he offered up prayers with loud crying and tears. And I don't doubt that he got that information from one of the three that were there hearing that. Now that's kind of a surprising description of our Lord. We read, for example, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, that... that Jesus is the author of salvation, and that word author can be translated as leader or captain, and I like that description, the captain of our salvation. He's leading many sons to glory, and so with that image of our Lord, we like to think of Him, I like to think of Him as leading the saints like an, an Alexander or an Achilles, not, not someone groveling in the dust. A worm and not a man as Psalm 22 describes him. What an image of the Son of God. A worm in the dust. 
Again, we wonder how this could be from a, a man who had faced unique challenges with complete confidence and control. He had subdued demons with a simple word. He'd silenced the wind and sea in a storm. He had fed multitudes with a few loaves and fishes. He'd raised the dead. No challenge was too big for him. He was always in command of every situation. No enemy was too strong or smart for him. He'd confronted and confounded the scribes and Sadducees in debate. No one and nothing could prevail over him. But now he is in the garden. He's in the olive press. And he is so undone that the blood and sweat are squeezed out of him. By his own confession, he was at the threshold of death. But haven't lesser men faced death more courageously than he did? That's the question that's sometimes asked. The history of the martyrs has stories of men and women being fed to the lions or burned at the stake and facing death with courage and faith singing hymns before the flames. Skeptics often refer to Socrates, a pagan, as giving a more gallant example of death, of meeting death and his end, than the one that's given here by Jesus. He too was unjustly sentenced to death, but... When Socrates' hour came, he took the hemlock without flinching and according to Plato, drank, drained the cup. He met death head on. But the cup Socrates drained and the one before Jesus were completely different. In both the Old and New Testaments, the cup is a symbol of the wrath of God. Isaiah 51 verse 17 speaks of the cup of God's anger. Jeremiah 25 verse 15 describes the cup of the, ra uh, the, cup of the wine of wrath. Psalm 11 calls it a cup filled with fire and brimstone and burning wind. We sometimes hear about a tempest in a teacup. It's a small thing. Well, this is a tempest in a cup that was no... Small thing. The cup was one of burning wind. Well, if it were simply physical death that Jesus faced, the separation of the soul from the body, that would have been something else. But this is about far more than physical death. Christ knew how gruesome crucifixion was. He was well aware of the pain and humiliation it involved. Any normal person would recoil from that. But that is not the reason the Lord was in great agony in the garden. It was the prospect of undergoing the terrible wrath of God, which is suffering beyond any human experience. These are unknown sufferings. These are sufferings beyond anything that we can fathom. In fact, his response here gives us some indication of how great and terrifying they are. So really, it's not puzzling, this agony. It's really clarifying. He understood what the cross meant. It was far more than nails and thorns. He was looking into the abyss of hell and infinite suffering. That's what he would experience. But even more, he understood Isaiah 53, that he would be numbered with the transgressors. Not simply that he would be crucified between two criminals, but he would be crucified as a criminal. In fact, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, God would make him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Can we really comprehend what that meant? I think not. Only one who is perfect, sinless, 
can possibly understand the utter horror of that, of, of becoming the sin bearer and undergoing divine punishment for us. Dr. Johnson tried to give some light with an analogy that is helpful, at least uh, in giving a sense of what the Lord must have felt. He said, imagine a pure young girl forced to enter a house of prostitution and live there. Multiply that sense of revulsion to infinity and one would have a pale illustration of the agony of Christ in identifying with human iniquity. Well, we can imagine that, but still, we really can't begin to comprehend the revulsion the Lord had as He finally came to the time when He would become sin for us. That would cause a separation from Him and His Heavenly Father, a separation that had never occurred before, a separation for the first time. He would be made a curse for us, Paul said, and abandoned by His Father because of our sins. That's what he dreaded. Not the few hours of physical pain, but the spiritual pain of a kind that we simply cannot grasp. What, he must, what we must believe is that it is infinitely worse than anything we can imagine. Now that being the case, and I truly believe that is the case, would men face death so bravely if they knew what will follow? What awaits them beyond the grave? Endless punishment? Separation forever from all that is good and joyful? Eternal darkness and utter despair? No, they wouldn't. But Christ knew. He saw the full horror of it. And his response was to fall on the ground in the dust and pray with loud crying and tears, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. This was always the temptation Jesus faced to avoid the cross. Satan tempted him with that in the wilderness at the beginning of the gospel. Tempted him three times. Peter did that after his great confession in chapter 8. And now as the hour approached and the cross appeared all the more clearly to him, the temptation became intense. Is there maybe another way? Is it possible to avoid this terrible hellish death? That's what he desired. He knew of none. He did not know of an alternative path. But in his human nature, with his human will, he looked to see if possibly there might be one. We must never forget that. We must never forget that, that Jesus was and is now and forever will be a man. The eternal Son of God became a man at His incarnation through the conception and birth of a virgin. Deity and humanity were joined, and He is now the God-man. The events in the garden occurred in His human nature. As a man, He had to learn God's will every day. He didn't float through life. He had to search the Scriptures and pray just as we do. That is what He was doing in the olive press. He wasn't seeking to change God's will. He was seeking an alternative to the cross within God's will and seeking it with complete confidence in God. He addressed Him in the most intimate of ways. Abba, Father. Abba is a special word. It's very much like our word Daddy. The Jews never addressed God as Abba because they thought it was too familiar and disgraceful. Disrespectful, rather. They approached God from a distance, fearing even to pronounce His name. By using that word, 
Jesus demonstrated his unique relationship with the Father. He is Abba. It is deeply personal, this relationship. It is infinite, this relationship. And so as he looked for another way, he looked to the one who loved him infinitely. And of course, if there had been a different way, his own father would have given it. His own father would have rescued his son, his only begotten son, from the terrors of Calvary. But he didn't. The reason is clear. There is no other way but the way of the cross if you and I were to be saved. If the law could not save us, or rather I should say if it could save us, if, if our works and deeds and our, our personal sacrifices could save us from the absolute justice of God, then the cross would have been unnecessary. Why go to the cross? Why send your son to die on a cross if the way of salvation is by good works? If the way of salvation is by the law? The, the death on the cross would have been completely unnecessary. It would not have happened. The fact that it did that the Son's heavenly Father, His Abba, did not remove the cup, is the proof that the cross of Christ alone is the only way of salvation and the only instrument of salvation. As Paul wrote in Galatians 2 verse 21, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Christ did not die needlessly. He died because our sins could only be removed by the death of a substitute. And that's what the Son was willing to be. More important to Him than avoiding the cross was doing God's will. That was His first desire. He prayed, yet not what I will, but what you will. So at some point in this terrible ordeal. Jesus realized that. He came to a full understanding of that. He accepted it and resolved to drain the cup of wrath so that we would escape it. That didn't happen immediately. It took time for Him to arrive at that. It took at least an hour. We know that because when He returned to the three disciples and found them sleeping, He said, could you not keep watch for one hour? And that indicates that he had been in his, his struggle for at least an hour. It, it wasn't short. I think that tells us something about prayer. Prayer doesn't always, uh, answers to prayer rather, don't always come easily or quickly. They require perseverance on our part. And sometimes they require some agony on our part. But to his experience of agony was added disappointment when he came and found his trusted disciples sleeping. He asked them to be watching, to be alert and prevent any, anyone from trespassing while he was in deep prayer at this most critical moment of his life to help him. And they could not do that. It was late, past midnight. It had already been a, a long and emotional evening. Sleep was natural in such circumstances. And, and they were overcome by it. But still, he had needed them and they failed. So he gave them some counsel in verse 38. Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So true. The flesh is weak. Never forget that. A person can have firm resolve to be brave and obedient as Peter was earlier when he vowed to be loyal to the Lord even unto death. And I think, as I said, Peter was honest in that, fully committed to that, but we are weak in our physical and psychological nature. 
We are easily overcome by temptation. So what's the solution? Well, first, to recognize that our, that our condition. Recognize that we are weak, that, that we don't have the natural strength to stand. We, we need to avoid temptation, but then to do that, we must do what our Lord said. Watch and pray. Understand that we're weak and be ever watchful. We must keep watching and praying, He said. And that indicates that this is a constant effort. We can never assume that we are in a safe place, that we are in a place where we can, in effect, let our guard down. Now we can rest. Now we don't have to worry. There's no such safe place. And the reason there's no such safe place is because our flesh is there with us wherever we are. And the flesh is always the same. Weak and prone to wander. Now, the truth of that statement is only confirmed by what follows. The Lord returned to pray two more times and returned to find the three disciples sleeping two more times. They just couldn't stay awake. They continued to fail. While He continued to pray, praying the same words, Mark says, He prayed that God's will be done. And He followed it. How unlike us that so often is. How, how unlike the first man that was. In Eden, the first garden, Adam said, my will be done. In this garden, Jesus said, thy will be done. Different desires and different results. Twice human history turned in a garden. In the first garden, Adam chose to disobey and lost the world. In the second garden, Jesus chose to obey and save it. He won the battle here in this garden. And it brings out a simple but very important truth. Good always comes from doing God's will as His will may be difficult, it may be a challenge, but the result of it is always good. We see that here. It's a hard lesson for us to learn, though. It was for His disciples. The Lord returned for the third and last time to find them sleeping again. But this time the situation had changed. He said, it is enough meaning it's all settled. The agony is over. He had His answer and had accepted the cross with firm resolve. The hour has come, He says. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. He could see the torches and soldiers coming across the Kidron Valley toward the garden. So He told the disciples, Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Now, they weren't ready for the storm to come, but he was now ready, and he rose to meet his betrayer and enemies in complete command of the situation. Now, that's the power of prayer. The Lord's experience here was unique. No one has ever gone through the agony Jesus suffered in the olive press of Gethsemane. But people do go through similar, similar experiences of difficulty. Uh, sometimes we face decisions that are very challenging, very difficult, and we face them alone. Our experiences are like David's in Psalm 23, who was in the dark valley alone. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You'll notice it's I, not we. And sometimes we must walk alone. That's the valley Jesus walked through. His friends slept. He had no helpers. He was alone in the dark. He was alone in the struggle. So should you ever pass through that dark valley? Don't despair. 
He knows. He knows what it's like. And He's praying for you. Even if friends sleep, we're never alone. He's a faithful high priest. In fact, in Psalm 121, we're told He will never slumber nor sleep. The valley may be long and we may struggle for a time just as the Lord did. Answers to prayers often don't come quickly or easily. And resolutions to our difficulties may be a a long way off. But there is an end and He is always with us. David prayed, though I walk through the valley, thou art with me. He's always with us. Paul discovered that. He prayed three times that a thorn be removed from his flesh. He prayed for that until he received an answer. He prayed three times. He would have prayed four times, ten times. But the answer came after three. And the answer was, no, the thorn will not be removed from you, but my grace is sufficient for you. And it was. And in fact, because of that thorn, he was able to minister more effectively. In fact, I think we could say Paul kissed that thorn because God used it greatly in his life. The Lord was with him. Grace was with him. And it was sufficient. Paul was all alone in Rome facing a trial before Caesar. And he said no one supported him. All of his allies deserted him. But, he said, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Christ did that with sympathy because He had been alone. And He did it with power because He is the eternal Son of God. And Paul said, I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The one who is on our side is both God and man. As a man, He experienced what we experience only to a far greater degree. He is able to understand our situation better than we are. He sympathizes with our situation because He's been there. And as God's eternal Son, the Almighty, our Creator, He can help. And He does. That brings us back to this moment in the garden when the Lord was so pressed that He almost died. Because it reminds us of two truths. The greatness of our sin and the greatness of His love. The fact that Jesus Christ, the God-man, could be so moved to loud crying and tears in such anguish and gloom is a witness to the awfulness of divine judgment. It is punishment. And it is endless. But it is beyond us. We cannot comprehend it. We can, however, get a small sense of how dreadful it is from the response of God's Son to it. He was horrified. That tells us everything about the nature of that punishment. Why is it so terrible? Why is it so horrifying? Because sin is so terrible. If we take hell lightly, it's because we take sin lightly. Sin is no light matter. It is the cause of death. It is the cause of death physically and the cause of death spiritually. And that spiritual death, if undergone, is irreversible and endless. Why? Because the justice of God is a holy justice. It is righteous justice. It is what God's justice requires. But there is great blessing in the midst of this. We see that. Here we see the immensity of God's love. That He would send His Son into the world to take that punishment for us, to drink the cup for us, and that He didn't remove that cup even at the pleadings of His Son, His only begotten Son. That amazed the apostles 
who witnessed this. In this is love, John wrote, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In spite of his pleadings, the Lord would not remove that cup, that death, because it was the propitiation. What's propitiation? It's satisfaction. It's the sacrifice that satisfied God's justice completely and in so doing turned away God's wrath from us. And the Son willingly suffered all that the cup of God's wrath required and did it, the author of Hebrews tells us, for the joy set before him. What was that joy? It was the joy of doing God's will, regardless of the challenge, regardless of the difficulty, regardless of the consequences. And there's no joy in this life apart from doing the will of God, even when it's difficult. We may seek to avoid a hard choice because of the difficulties that follow, and we may think we'll be happier if we don't go through that, and so we balk at it, we take the wrong path. And we may not go through the difficulty, but we won't experience the joy that can only come through obedience. So that even when it's hard, even when it's a great difficulty, the joy will be there. It will be a consequence of obedience. It was that that was the joy set before him, but it was also the joy of gaining for himself sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, in the family that he bought and paid for at the cross through the shedding of his blood for us. That gave him the greatest joy and made him go forth from the garden confident and courageous. He knew his death would snatch them, snatch his people from the burning. He loved you that much and more, infinitely. We cannot understand fully the love of God for us and we'll spend all eternity seeking to understand it more. Certainly we see that here. The wages of sin is death, Paul told the Romans, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The only way to receive that free gift is by believing in Him. We cannot earn it. We cannot achieve it in anything we do. We can simply recognize our complete inability and receive his gift of life obtained for us through his suffering and death at Calvary. So that means trusting in him as God's son and the savior of men. And all day long he invites us to do that. That's what the prophet Isaiah said. Isaiah 65, verse 2, all day long he stretches out his hands to a rebellious people, to sinners, and he invites them to come. If you've not come to him, that invitation is for you. To come to him, believe in him. He receives all who do, and may all who have done that, and I hope it's everyone here, rest and rejoice in that. We have a Savior who's passed through the worst things that we could possibly go through, and experience them to a far greater degree, and he'll never leave us or forsake us, and he'll be with us through every dark valley we travel. That's something to rejoice in. It's something to give great thanks for what he did for us to obtain our salvation. Father, we do confess your Son as our Savior and our God, the second person of the triune God, and we thank you that you sent him into this